Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be meeting with you here. And um, I guess I'm supposed to uh, talk to you a bit about uh, what sort of what's I, the way I interpret it is sort of what do we know about what works in education? Um, and we've had um, many, many years of uh, criticisms of American education, and uh, more recently, there have been large numbers of uh, test results uh, coming both internationally and nationally. And so, uh, let me summarize quickly uh, where we are and what I think we know about um, what seems to make for a better educational system uh, for our kids and uh, what uh, has failed to work. Um, so we did a study uh, last year, which was pretty interesting. It was a response to a lot of um, hand wringing uh, about how well the, the United States, uh, st the students in the United States perform on international tests. And we don't do very well on a test called the PISA, the program for um, international student uh, assessment run out of the Paris OECD, uh, which uh, about 50 or 60 countries participate in. We do uh, somewhat better on another test called Trends in International Math and Science Survey. Um, in any case, um, math seems to be the subject that we don't do as well in in the United States, uh, and science and reading, we do better. And we do better in the earlier grades than we do in middle school and high school. Um, but here's the issue. There is no U.S. educational system. There are at least 51 different systems. And this is really important to keep in mind because there is huge variation between different states on how well kids do and what we know about the quality of the education they're receiving. So the other thing is that we have to keep in mind that something that is a, a sorry statement about the American educational system, but we have a very high percentage compared to other developed countries of poor children in school. So when we make, when we assess what's going on in school, we have to keep in mind that the US has the highest uh, poverty rate among children of any developed country, of any country in the OECD, except Chile, which is uh, a fairly new member. But all the European countries have much lower um, levels of poverty. And um, um, that includes even countries like Spain or Italy or, or Greece. So I have to keep that in mind. But when we make comparisons of kids of similar levels of uh, home resources, um, we found that uh, um, some of the states do extraordinarily well with their students, even on an international comparison. And other states do really terribly. And some states have made enormous gains uh, in test scores, and other states uh, have not made such large gains. But overall, on the national test, uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, there have been these very large uh, gains over the past 25 years. The, the last 2015 result uh, went down for the first time in 25 years. And the math, the math gains have been, have been larger than the reading gains, but reading gains are up too. And this is true at eighth grade and fourth grade. Now, some states have made big gains and some states have made smaller gains. Um, so 
from these kind of data, and I admit the test data is always uh, should be taken with certain uh, amounts of, uh, I would say, care in what interpreting that as learning. Uh, from these data, uh, what we figured out is that certain states are doing things that are really making a lot of difference. Uh, here are some of the things that seem to have worked. And these are, I'm citing a, a bunch of studies uh, that have been rather carefully done. So we know that states like Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Texas, these are states uh, you can see with a, with a variety of regions and um, uh, not necessarily rich, just rich states uh, have uh, done stuff in mathematics, which has really improved, made huge gains for their kids in how well they learn mathematics. Now, these changes took place at different times. So the big changes in Texas took place in the 80s and early 90s, but they continue to um, do well uh, as a result of those changes. Massachusetts did it more recently in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, North Carolina did it in the 90s. Uh, Minnesota has done it in the 80s and 90s. And all these states made big progress compared to neighboring states. So Minnesota versus Iowa, Massachusetts versus Connecticut, Texas versus California is not exactly a neighboring state, but a similar state demographically. North Carolina compared to Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee more recently has done very well too by making the same kind of changes recently that North Carolina did earlier. So what were those changes? Well, first of all, they made in, in, mass, in mathematics, they made, they put in harder, uh, higher standards in mathematics. Uh, and then they trained their teachers to use that curriculum. And they also supported their districts in uh, implementing the, uh, the curriculum by actually spending more money on schools. Another reform, so all the states did that, uh, that were successful. The other thing that states have done is because in the 1990s, there became sort of a new measure of what you're supposed to do is called funding for adequacy. Adequacy means that you say, we're gonna achieve a certain minimum standard in what we consider good schooling. And we're gonna invest the money necessary for those schools that are not meeting those standards in terms of physical plant, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the level of education, the, the level of uh, success that the kids are having in school. And we're gonna spend more on those districts that are having difficulty meeting those standards. And they did spend more. And we found, uh, our studies found, that the kids from those lower income districts made quite large gains uh, over this period of time. And the, the states that did these things compared to states that didn't, the low income districts did much better. That doesn't mean that all low income kids in these states did better because only part of the low income kids are in low income districts. They're scattered uh, throughout districts. So we know that spending more money, these, now these are all um, sort of broken myths. It used to be that people saw, it, oh, money doesn't make any difference. Money doesn't make any difference in education. That's a widely held view. Uh, and it shows now that that's wrong. Money does make a difference in education. I live in the state of California, and uh, we had a Proposition 13, which prevented uh, increasing property taxes more than 1% a year. Uh, and this killed education in California. So it's well known in California that the much slower growth of spending in the 70s and 80s, late 70s and into the 80s and 90s was devastating for California education. We're one of the, our kids even controlling for the fact that we have a high percentage of English language learners, 
and uh, fairly low income kids in school, even can taking all that in consideration, we're one of the worst performing states. And certainly, and we're one of the lowest spending states uh, on education and one of the highest cost of living states. So this had a devastating effect. So this myth has been broken. Spending more on education does make a difference. Now, of course, it depends how you spend it. Uh, spending more in low income districts has a better bang for your buck than spending more in high income districts. Um, so we know that if you invest in better curriculum, spend more on your low income districts, um, uh, organize uh, teacher education, in service training for your teachers to learn how to teach the new curriculum, uh, make sure all the stuff gets implemented um, statewide to every district. That means you need good administration at the state level and a willingness to do this and leadership to do it. You can make big gains, uh, at least on these test scores. Uh, and this is a national test. It's not a state test. So it's a test that nobody teaches to. Um, what doesn't work and I just published a piece for the Economic Policy Institute yesterday. What doesn't work is school choice. School choice, which is vouchers and charter schools, does give parents choice, which is a good thing. Parents like to have more choice. And low-income parents are locked in to low-income districts, and they don't. Their public schools may not be very good in. in most places, even though they're making improvements. And so having a choice is really good politically uh, for those groups and for other groups too. So people who believe that private education is going to solve the problems, you're never going to convince them that it doesn't work and they're going to move ahead with it. Um, people who believe that uh, investing more in poor kids and uh, in these kinds of programs that I talked about, you'll never, uh, they're much more concerned with equity and much more concerned uh, with evidence, I think. So I'll leave it at that. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Hello, can you hear me all right? Hi. How are you doing? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, hi, I'm Bernard Bull. I'm a professor at Concordia University in Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee, so I'm pretty familiar with that context. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak briefly to um, our measures. So you spoke about how school choice does not work to improve test scores, but when we investigate, when we study what parents most want from a school, the number one priority is consistently that they want safety for their children and a positive, safe environment for, for their children during school. It has nothing to do with the future. Um, the second has to do with future preparation as they might define it. And that might be military service, it might be employment, it might be college. And there are, as you know, there, there are um, other indicators of student success in those environments that, that seem to be stronger than performance on standardized tests. Um, so can you speak to, as, we, as you've engaged in this kind of study, um, are there other measures when we're comparing uh, um, like voucher and choice and these kinds of programs, are there other measures worth looking at to see if whether or not there might be other possible um, affordances, other possible um, uh, uh, benefits that are coming from this other, even though it might not be um, moving the needle on test scores? Yeah, I, I agree that, the, that the, there are a couple of studies, one in Milwaukee and one in Washington, D.C., that suggests that um, high school graduation rates are higher and the college going gra uh, rates are higher. And, and um, this is mainly from kids attending uh, uh, Catholic schools, uh, which in general have had a, a, a better record, the Catholic high schools, uh, that have had a somewhat better record of getting kids into college and to finishing high school graduation. But, uh, we don't know from these studies, by the way, uh, to what degree the, these, uh, these higher graduation rates are due to uh, the actual ability of the schools to do something 
uh, you know, somehow are able to uh, get the kids to finish or that whether they're uh, shedding uh, kids uh, in, you know, sophomore and junior year uh, who simply aren't meeting the standards that they have uh, and bringing in kids even in junior year who are more likely to graduate. Uh, as you know, in places like Milwaukee and, and D.C., uh, there's tremendous churning uh, between schools. So Milwaukee, I did when, in my study in Milwaukee, uh, I just tried to follow kids for one year and see what the test score gains were in in, in public schools. Ah, okay, yeah, uh, looks All like right. Brian just jumped in here anyway. So <laughs> thank you so much for taking okay. the time to answer that question. All right, sure. Hi, Brian. Well, thank you. Uh, Martin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you perfectly. And can everybody else in the uh, in the crowd hear me? If you can, just say something in the chat. I hope I'm not a black blob or an invisible box. You're very clear to me. Well, that's good. That's very good. Uh, some can hear me, some cannot. Um, I'm going to proceed uh, uh, as if people can hear me. Um, Professor Carnoy, I, I have to, first of all, apologize so much uh, for this horrendous technical problem. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, I don't know if we need to use a, a Ouija board or divination to make it work again. <laughs> um, let me, uh, above all, uh, thank you so much for not just coming, not just bringing your, your research here, but also for being such a fantastically flexible, good sport and uh, speaking and uh, answering questions. Uh, I'm I'm really really grateful. Thank you. Well, it's nice to have you on. Oh, it's it's great to be on. This has literally never happened before, um, right. which is always famous last words, right? Um, right. I I had a whole raft of questions uh, to ask you, um, but I I'm worried that I might trip over some of the things that you've just been saying. If I pose you a question, uh, can you tell me if you've already talked about it, and then I can move on to another? Sure. Um, first of all, you just have to say your research is so important, so vital right now as we look carefully at both K through 12 and higher education. Um, one of the things that struck me about your work is how strong class was as a determining factor, um, that uh, both in the sense of class shaping outcomes, uh, academic outcomes for students, but also uh, you see that reflecting increasing class inequality. Uh, for example, at one point you refer to uh, the proportion of low-income students in U.S. schools increasing rapidly uh, from 2000 to 2013. The number of eighth grade mathematics students uh, eligible for free lunch went up from 35.1 to 50% plus. Um, I got asked, do you, do you see class now as the leading factor driving differences um, among students? Well, it's an important factor, and I think that one of the things about it is that it seems that the class differences in, in performance in school do not seem to be decreasing. And some studies seem to indicate that it's increasing. On the other hand, uh, racial and ethnic differences seem, the gaps seem to be closing. Uh, so um, we just published a paper um, earlier this year in January that showed that uh, both for African Americans and and non English language learner Hispanics, the gap right. is closing quite significantly. Uh, but the the class differences may be widening, so that's a feature of American education that we should pay a lot of attention to, and and watch carefully. But I did mention before, uh, you probably didn't meant, uh, get it, that there's a new study a relatively new study that shows that certain strategies can close those class differences, especially between low income differences, low income districts and high income districts in a state. And that is increased investment in the low income districts. Uh, so there's a very good study, two very good studies that show that that's true. Have you looked at, uh, at Vermont for that? Because we actually had that... Uh equalization of state of school funding across the state have i did what was the first the question 
have you looked in Vermont for this? Um, oh, I have not. No, we, we the study that I'm citing. I have not done this study, but the study hmm. I'm citing uh, looked across all the states that that uh, put in uh, adequacy spending measures. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. tried to equalize spending between low and high income districts versus states that didn't. And they showed that the gains for the low income districts were uh, significantly higher in those states that put in these adequacy measures. This was across states. Well, I'm, I'm asking about uh, Vermont in particular because not just because I live here, that's, that's irrelevant, but because the state about 20 years ago passed a, um, a law which leveled funding. Uh, across the state, uh, so very controversial law, very uh, very challenging. But uh, basically, it's a complicated formula. But the differences that we see in most of the country between towns and within towns, between schools, uh, we really don't see here. Um, so it's a tiny state; it's a very unusual state. But that might be something interesting to look at. Well, I can say I can say one thing about Vermont, and that is because this the study that we did of differences between the states over a. Uh, uh, almost, uh, I think, 17-year period, 1996 to 2013. Mm. Um, Vermont is not only one of the higher scoring states, but is one of the states that's made the, uh, among the larger gains in both mathematics and reading. So wow. whatever, whatever Vermont is doing, um, like Massachusetts, uh, they're, they're, they're one of the states that, that we should look at, even though these are small states, Right. Uh, that we can look at as an example. So I cited uh, in mathematics the states we can look at that have made, done very well, are North Carolina, Massachusetts, um, Minnesota, and Texas. Um, so uh, Texas has this hugely diverse population. It's a large right. state. And right. yet they've made, i got to hand it to them, big gains in mathematics, particularly in the 1990s. Hmm. And the formula in all these states is pretty similar. Uh, you, have to, uh, you really have to have the, the, the will to implement new standards in mathematics, uh, train the teachers to use those new standards, and uh, uh, give support to districts to implement uh, all these standards. So new standards. You, really have to put, you have to put money behind it. You have to spend money. So, well, that's fantastic. I'm so glad that you have the formula. Um, we're going to have to uh, uh, make a point of following that across the country. But, but before I ask another question, uh, let me just remind everybody that uh, there are uh, four different ways that you can pose questions. And uh, Professor Cornoy's research, I'm sure, is going to elicit a lot of questions and comments from you all. So if you are new or if you haven't looked at this interface for a while, please look on the very bottom right of your screen. Uh, you will see a teal-colored box. Uh, one of them has a question mark. And if you click that, you can type in a question, which I can then read out loud and will flash on the screen. If your mic and camera work, blessed thing when it does, then you can click on the raised hand button, and that'll let us know that you want to come up on stage, like Bernard Bull just did a few minutes ago. Uh, if you'd like to chat with people in your immediate rooms, so that's roughly the 20 people nearest you, click on that little kind of cartoon dialogue box, and you can chat. Um, already the room I'm in has had a lot of conversation happening. Mark Wilson, Autumn Keynes are having a good conversation. And on top of that, if you'd like to go over to Twitter, please tweet uh, using the hashtag FTTE. Uh, and already people have been making some observations. Paul Signorelli, last week's guest, has shared a few thoughts, uh, and I've been sharing a few screenshots. So please, don't let me monopolize the floor. There's a lot of questions for you guys, and we'd love to hear from them. Um, Martin, I, I, I have to uh, ask a, a related question, uh, which is you speak about the state effect uh, in your research. Um, and we know from PISA uh, that the differences between states, especially mathematics scores, are, are quite drastic. Um, how do you, you know, what can we do about this? How, well, I should say first, how deep is the state effect? And, uh, and the state effect is big. The state effect is big. In wow. fact, if you not, if you talk about TIMS, which yeah. had more states take the TIMS, then the P, P's only had three states in 2012, and I think only two states in 2015 took it. But at Tim's nine states took it in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
there's a nice variety of states. So one of the little sort of factoids that I like is that the lowest socioeconomic class kids uh, in Massachusetts score about the same as the highest socioeconomic class kids in Alabama uh, wow. on the TIMS. Wow. So that's, I mean, Alabama is the bottom, Massachusetts the top. Right. But just to show you, now you could ask yourself, do the highest socioeconomic class kids in Alabama care that they <laughs> score no higher? Because in terms of their labor market, they're the mm -hmm. top of the heap. So they're the ones that are going to go to university, et cetera, et cetera. So it could, you could argue that it doesn't make any difference. But if the kids in Alabama want to get jobs in Silicon Valley, right? maybe that's a problem, right? Uh, kids in Massachusetts are going to have a better shot at that. I mean, that's very rhetorical. There are obviously a lot of really smart kids in Alabama, you know, that have been persistent. Yeah, they, they, you could argue that they don't really care because in terms of their world, uh, they're mm -hmm. still at the top. But um, it it is the problem that you face when you say, we make comparisons with the United States with other countries, because you've got this tremendous variation within the United States. Um, and that has to do with gains also, by the way. There's some states making big gains and some states not. So I'll give you an example. There are a couple of very high scoring states uh, that were high scoring back in uh, the 90s, uh, Nebraska right. and uh, North Dakota. Okay, These are essentially all white states or close mm -hmm. to all white states. And they mm -hmm. score very high, but they've made almost no gains since that time because mm -hmm. they didn't do anything they didn't do i mean they just sort of was very laissez-faire you know we're okay and uh, uh. <laughs> they they didn't uh, put in reforms to improve things they just sort of let it go so the uh they don't have that culture of continuous innovation or continuous improvement well they you know they they're pretty high they're still pretty high but they're just not making very much progress. So they can coast. Yeah, and it's a problem in 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 a number of states um, in the Midwest, but there are other states in the Midwest that have done quite well. Uh, states like Minnesota have really implemented a lot of change and they've done much better. I, I have to ask, I mean, looking forward, the the purpose of this forum is to discuss the future of education. And I, I have to wonder, where do you see these different, where do you see these different outcome trends playing out? Uh, I mean, that is, do you, do you see increasing differences by economic inequality as overall economic inequality persists? Do you see the state effect deepening or, or shifting? Um, how do you see these well, trends changing? A lot depends what happens in the, current political climate, because mm. uh, I think the Obama's, Obama administration's education policy wasn't terribly illuminated either, uh, mm -hmm. but um, it depends. I, first of all, the good news is that states are in charge. The states are in charge of education. Federal mm -hmm. government has very little impact. Mm -hmm. Federal government can be... Uh, can suggest reform, you know, the Bush people put in the, the No Child Left Behind. The No Child Left Behind did increase accountability, and mm -hmm. there's some evidence that it actually contributed to rising test scores. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, um, the Obama administration was pushing uh, the new standards, the Common Core. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, going to be, they're going to be states that resist that. A uh, number of states already have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think under the Trump administration, probably there'll be more room for states to opt out of it. Um, mm. It's probably a mistake. Uh, however, to do a really good job on Common Core, you have to really train, invest a lot of money in training the teachers to teach it. Uh, it's mm. a new curriculum and it's a more difficult curriculum. Right. Um, it could in the long run do what happened in Massachusetts, and that is that actually improve uh, how how well kids learn these subjects. They could be the more demanding, but you do have to invest a lot of money in training the teachers. 
if the Trump administration is successful in diverting attention uh, into vouchers and charters in a, in a bigger way, uh, I think those states that pay attention to that and do it are going to suffer because those things don't work. They don't work. Right. Sorry. I mean, the, the charters bring in, ch charters have one good effect, and that is they bring in new people into the education world uh, who are, some of them are quite innovative, and they try new things, and uh, and some charter schools are really excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But on average, it's not the solution to problems. It does, as Brian said earlier, it gives people choice, uh, gives people the option to send their kids where they want. And I think that's very positive. Uh, but really, the choice, um, the choice strategy we should follow is to give every kid in America a good choice by improving the schools on average by mm. a lot more. Mm. Okay. So then you don't have to worry about attending a really bad school because right. even if there are differences in schools in Massachusetts, the kids attending the worst schools are attending schools which are better than most schools in Alabama. Right. The worst school. That's what you want to get to. You want to get to the point where you don't have to force parents to think of every day about, is this a good school for my kid? Uh, and that, that's really what the objective of these states should be, uh, to, to create that kind of school system. So people, right now, if you, if you have a choice system, you can always say to parents, you made the wrong choice. You chose, right. the, wrong, you chose the wrong school. It's your problem. Okay. We, I don't think we should do that. I don't think parents know enough about, I hate to say this, I'm a very well-informed parent. And I honestly <laughs> uh, cannot tell. I went into my daughter's high school. It was very difficult for me to tell whether the teacher was good or bad, unless the teacher was just terrible. Right. You, right. you know what I mean? So oh, I, I, I absolutely don't. Um, I, yeah, I, it's very hard. It's very hard to tell. I mean, take your car to an auto mechanic, and you don't have any idea of how good they are until the end of the process. In no, school, it's, the uh, process is long. There, so you, don't, you can't tell until it's too late. We have two vital domains in America where we have bad transparency, and one is healthcare, and the other is education. Absolutely, and these, are not, these are not well run. These are not what. These are not very. The markets do not work very well in yeah. either of those domains. Yeah, that, it seems that's clear. Anybody who thinks about it realizes that that's true. Um, and, I, I I agree. Uh, another another solution that people pose to the question of, of school quality is to um, uh, work uh, with technology. And I I don't know. Again, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear. I literally couldn't hear the first. I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about technology at all. But so, so. And this is this is a huge issue. And I, I'm I'm just wondering what kind of uh, role for technology in K through 12 do you see moving forward? You know, over the next say 10 years. I think there, um, the, the traditional ways of using technology, for example, you know, Khan Academy kind of stuff. You know what the Khan Academy mm -hmm. is? You know, these yep. Yep. Um, very popular use of technology. Um, mm -hmm. Computers in the schools is another popular uh, mm -hmm. use of technology. Um, I don't think, I mean, those are nice little add-ons, but they're not going to do very much in order to, in order to have, in order to use technology effectively, which you have to have teachers who are very well trained to work with that technology with the kids. Uh, it's, it's not a replacement for a, a skilled classroom teaching. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it, could, it could be a useful helper uh, if the teacher is trained to use it, it's like another form of curriculum. Mm -hmm. If it's well done, it can help, uh, it can enhance learning, but it's usually not well done. That's the problem. Uh, the teachers aren't trained to, to use mm -hmm. it, et cetera. Now, 
there are wonderful stuff happening in science education of mm -hmm. you know hands-on science has now become terrifically sophisticated where kids can do experiments using materials and new kinds of rather cheap equipment like 3d printers uh, and stuff like that and you can really teach kids early on like late primary school middle school to be it truly involved in doing experiments and learning science in in a very productive way and so i'm i think that's one area where it's going to be where where technology uh, become very cheap and mm -hmm. you can really involve kids in science in ways that you couldn't earlier on very to make them very interested and engaged in science and very few schools are using that uh, only quite elite schools um, have, and it's not that expensive to do. We have a, I have a colleague here that has a fab lab uh, in which kids come in from low income schools nearby and really get involved in doing science. And, and, and they're trying to increase the number of low income, you know, Hispanic and black kids to, mm -hmm. to go into STEM fields. Mm -hmm. And this is a good way to do it. Well, I, there was, um, I saw a fantastic project in uh, North Carolina that was using uh, laptops in the classroom to get students interested in STEM. And the angle was uh, the laptops ran software that let the students create and mix music. Uh, so they, they were able to connect with the music that they loved and then see algorithms and computational thinking and then could, could really run with it. But yeah. before I say anything about that, there's a question we have uh, from Ross White who asks a very simple and powerful question. Why don't markets work well in education? Yes, that's a very good question, actually. And it's, <laughs> I've thought about this a long time and so have many other people. And I think they don't work well in education because um, for one thing, uh, the capacity to respond to market incentives is often too low uh, for anything to happen. I'll give you an example. Hmm. Let's say that there's a school in Milwaukee that's surrounded now by private schools uh, mm -hmm. competing for students, voucher students, and the school loses a lot of students. So the assumption is that now this school will respond, this public school will respond by doing stuff that really improves their school so that they can uh, keep the students. But that assumes that the school knows what to do in order mm -hmm. to really improve their, <laughs> their students. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they don't, that's the problem. They can exert more effort for a little while, right. but right. once you exert a little bit more, you know, most teachers work pretty hard to start with. Absolutely. Now, exert a little bit more effort. I mean, the idea of economists is that all oh, students, the teachers are just sitting around and that's why the test scores right. are low. No, the teachers aren't sitting around. The teachers actually aren't that great at teaching. That's one thing. So uh, now the private school, interestingly enough, in Milwaukee, probably isn't actually doing much better than a public school, okay? But mm. they do have this cachet of being private. Mm -hmm. People are right. maybe sending their kids there because it's a safer environment, right. not that they're having higher test scores, et cetera. So uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, although there's not a terribly lot of evidence, uh, the private school may be cream skimming. And maybe mm. just take in the students that they want. Okay, but the main thing is that the capacity to respond is probably not high enough. So the assumption is that in markets is that there's competition, so only the uh, uh, the fittest will survive. Right. Uh, right. Now, here's another issue: there are a certain percentage of parents that just want to keep their kids in the neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. School is not just a place where kids learn, it's a place where they're parked by the parents. 
So I don't know if you know this, Brian, but uh, healthcare, most people choose their healthcare provider in terms of how easy it is to get there. <laughs> yes, especially for emergency. Terms of the quality of the healthcare. Yeah. So same thing yeah. with schooling. There's a high percentage of parents that just want the convenience of the school. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why competition may not work. I mean, it isn't the same. You can't sort of go online and choose the cheapest, <laughs> cheapest, best product in terms right. of schooling. You have to take your kid to the school. You know, online education for, for young kids is mm -hmm. also not very effective because you need the discipline of the kid to be able to do it or the parent has to be basically homeschooling the kid. Uh, these are all things that interfere with the market mechanism. So I think those are some of the reasons. But I think the, the main underlying reason, and by the way, the competitors aren't much better than the public schools, if they're mm. better at all. Mm. Mm. You know, So it isn't just the public schools that don't know what to do, it's the private schools don't know what to do. Now, uh, an earlier uh, person, I think Brian also, right, mm -hmm. said uh, maybe. that the graduation rates, you didn't hear that, but the graduation rates in some of these private schools are higher mm -hmm. in Milwaukee. Okay, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. true. And I think that one way that public schools can improve graduation rates and college going is to invest pretty cheap, hire more college counselors. Mm -hmm. Hire mm -hmm. more college counselors. Very hmm. simple investment. A typical hmm. high school, my daughter's high school in Palo Alto, pretty elite public school in California, had two counselors for 400 kids in senior wow. year. Didn't know anything about wow. the kids. Typical. That's typical of a high school, public high school. A, a private school down the road will yeah. have one counselor for 50 kids. Wow. Instead of 200. And they go to the colleges, they make arrangements, you know. Sure. It's very easy to get college going rates up. You just have to invest in it. And it's not that expensive. Not that expensive. Um, Martin, I, I, I hate to say this, but we are we are just past the end of our hour. Uh, and, okay. and we're in many ways just scratching the surface from all the all the rich ideas that you've been that you've been uh, drawing attention to. Um, Again, I, I apologize uh, for having been a terrible host. I greatly I enjoyed, I enjoyed meeting you. And, oh, it's uh, a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions I'd like to follow up, and uh, everything from uh, uh, talking about Robert Putnam to uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk about my local school board experience as well. Um, okay. But, but let, let me just why, once again. Why don't we do it again? Why don't we do it I again? Would like, I would like that. I would like it very much. Uh, especially uh, as as you have uh, uh, more research that, that goes on, uh, we'd also like to hear your thoughts uh, about the unfolding Trump administration uh, as it as the it progresses. What? Trump administration. Oh yeah, as it, as it progresses, if if progress is the right word. Um, I I have a in the Washington Post today. Oh. Go ahead. Are you still there? Yes. In the Washington Post today. Um, I just, uh, Economic Policy Institute just published, um, you can just go to Econo EPI, Economic mm -hmm. Policy Institute, mm -hmm. and there's a new article about vouchers in there. The Washington oh, really? Post has it also today. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, I will look that up um, as uh, right after this, um, and I'll share that uh, as well. Um, good. But don't don't go away because I, I need to tell everybody about our guest next week, and it's someone that I think you have uh, so much in common with and so many connections with. Um, every everyone, let me just say once again, I, I'm, I'm I apologize for uh, having uh, been uh, knocked offline for the first half. So let's point towards next week, uh, and uh, and hopefully there'll be uh, more technological triumphs uh, ahead. Uh, our guest next week is Professor Sarah Goldrick Reb. Uh, who is the author of several books, including most recently, Paying the Price, a book looking hard at the problems of college financial aid. Uh, so you may know that we've been doing an online reading of that for the past month, uh, located on my blog. 
Uh, and we are just just finished it off, and we will have a lot of questions to ask. The book is a is meticulously researched, solidly grounded data, and a really searing indictment of just how far off the rails uh, higher education financial aid has gone. So please come back next week, and we'd uh, love to hear from you. Um, also, between uh, now and next week, we have to think about what to read in our book club. So if you have any suggestions, let us know. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about the Future Trends Report, go to ftte.us. If you'd like to find out more about Shindig, go to shindig.com. Uh, and if you'd like to find out more about today's subject, we have placed a, a bunch of links in the, uh, on Twitter. And so you can follow those up, including Professor Carnery's recent work. Um, and once again, thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.